You're listening to That Gets My Goat. Hello and welcome to another Doonstief That Gets My Goat on the go. We are now on the go back home. Las Vegas is in our rearview mirror. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield, and now I'm sad. Thanks a lot. Oh, sorry. Let's just lie. Let's say that this is our first episode since Christmas. And we can talk a tiny bit about why, what we did for Christmas and, uh, you know, it's a new year. And we'll, we'll just pretend that, that everything is still ahead of us. Is that okay? Okay. Well, what I did for Christmas was the cutest of Santa's elves. What did you do for Christmas? Uh, the ugliest <laughs> one. <laughs> Turned out to be only slightly female, too, darn it. But that's okay, you know. It's, uggos need love, too. Some, some more than others, actually. Naughty girls need love, too, as well. That's right. Samantha, Samantha Fox. Was such a wild dame. Uh, what does Samantha Fox say? She says, like, huh, what's your name? No, no. And then she says, S -S 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 Samantha. Sorry, let me say it again. What does Samantha Fox say? Oh, she says, ring, ding, 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 ding. But with big boobies. Yes. Yes. So yeah, we're on our way back. I thought we could talk a little bit about how it went in uh, Las Vegas. I wasn't joking. I wanted oh, you this, really wanted? To I wanted pretend. this to be the first episode that we did, you know, in our whole marathon of on the goes. But okay. never mind. It's all right. I, okay, we can go back and do that then. Just to edit this bit out then. Well, it's just uh, you and I were only able to get together the one time uh -huh. in December, and it was we kind of had to because we had. The Secret Santa sequel coming out, but your schedule and my schedule got really, really rough. Of course, whoa! Oops, sorry. Of course, suddenly there become time for Christmas parties, and I hey, I got to get my shopping done, and or you know, hey, the kids have a, a Christmas performance at their school, or you know, whatever it is, and so we just couldn't get together much at all, and so I wanted to do that gets my goats where we talked about stuff and I, we wanted to go see frozen and talk about that and uh, we just couldn't do it in fact i think there was something that we both saw or, or read or talked about maybe it was a news story or whatever we're like hey let's talk about that but we couldn't we never got together even like going over skype live it was just like dude it's quarter to two i i can't do it i gotta be up and sit right you know right i was just like dude i gotta get up and uh jog that's another okay. thing. Yeah, you had made this goal, uh, and it might be, uh, this might be revisionist history, but let's just say that you made a goal of running 500 miles in 2013, uh, and as it got closer and closer to the end of the year, you, you know, you started to realize, hey, I to make this, I'm going to have to work. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? It it was that way, not revisionist history at all. True fact. The reason I said revisionist history is because I didn't know. I thought maybe you had made a goal of 500 miles by June, and then I'm going to do a marathon, and I'm going to do another five. I'm going to do a thousand miles or whatever. No, I I made the goal of 500, expecting that I would easily uh, exceed that because I did also have the goal of doing a marathon, and. Yeah, the marathon goal went by the wayside. I, I was doing really well the first half of the year. I started working on the 500 miles in February, and I was really doing well, and I got up to where I was jogging 13 miles on the weekend when I had to do the long, um, you know, the long runs. You do the shorter ones during the week because, you know, people have less time, and then on Saturday you go out and you run the long one. And I, was, I did 13 miles a couple of times, including once, which was an actual race. I ran a half marathon. And then right after the half marathon, I thought, you know what? I was having like nagging kind of injuries, shin splints kind of stuff. And I understood that what I needed to do was rest, give myself some time to rest so that I could recuperate. And then I could get back to uh, running like that again. And well, also I rested and then never really got back to it but also you you moved right and you were homeless for so long if that had not happened if you hadn't had to get a new house and squat on everybody's couch for a month 
and then get a new car and all that stuff, you would have made your goal before it got cold. Yeah, I would And that's have. another stumbling block, at least for me. I will never run if it's 10 degrees outside or whatever, <laughs> because it just hurts too much. Plus, when it gets cold, I don't want to do anything. My ambition, which is already atrophied, becomes pathetic. And yeah, I did, I did run into all sorts of various things, and I found it easy to put it off. And at one point, you know, I, I got kind of rested for more than a month, and then I was just like, oh, crap. I was supposed to run my marathon, like, in the middle of September, and that's, like, a month away now. There's no way I'm going to make it. And so I started trying to train, and I figured, okay, we'll put it off to October. And I just kind of got, tried to get back into it, and I ran a little bit here and there, and then I'd rest, and I never really got into it very well. But, yeah, there came a point where I looked at the calendar, and I looked at where I was at, and I think I was 61 miles short of 500 miles when December started. And I realized I need to start going fast because that's at least two miles a day, which of course I'm not gonna run every single day. So it's gonna be more like three or four or five miles. And at the same time, I again was having shin splints problems. So I needed to rest again. So I rested another week, which gave me even less time to get that 61 miles in. And it got to the point right at the end where basically I had to run five miles every day that I could run or else I wouldn't make it. Um, so even if it hurt, I just had to stumble through it. And even if I was tired, I had to stumble through it. And I did a lot of that there right at the end. I was stumbling along because I was tired. I wanted to, to rest, but I didn't have time for it. So I forced myself to do it, and the day before New Year's, I managed to get to 500 miles. You, uh, as sort of a side project or a side benefit to all this running, decided to film yourself each day just a little tiny bit and make compilation videos of your running, of your goal reaching. Uh huh. And you did some, you know, when you reached what was the first. The first one was when I reached 100 miles, and the second one was when I reached 250, and then the last one was going to be when I reached 500, which cool. I've started working on, but I'm not done with yet. Oh, okay. I was going to say, people should go out there and watch those because it is really fun to see, uh, you know, the, the leaves change, to see it snow, to see it rain, to see the sunshine, to see he's running at the not in the morning, to see he's running in the afternoon. All that stuff is pretty neat. And you put mon uh, money, you put music underneath it, and that, I don't know, makes it seem more inspiring. I remember you said that that actually helped motivate you, is knowing that, that you'd be able to make these videos. Yeah, and actually a lot of them I would make as I was going along, which I should have done with the last one. I'd shoot the shots, and I'd put them in a folder on my computer, and just let them sit there. But if I had been making the video as I went along, I think I would have been much more motivated to not rest, to keep going, and to get it done. Because yeah, when I was doing the 250 miler one and the 100 miler one, I started putting them together early on. And then each day I would just add in the next shot. That was really motivational for me, just the, the wanting to put in the next shot even though I maybe didn't feel like running, I would still go out and do it so I could do another shot and get it in there that day. So yeah, I'm, I'm uh, working on the final one. I've got to figure out how I'm going to work the graphics in, but... Uh, do you have any running goals for 2014? Uh, my 2014 running goal is to complete a marathon, which was actually one of my 2013 running goals too. And I slacked off on it and never made it to that. So this year, and that's going to be my sole goal, is to complete a marathon. And my sister is going to do it with me, and I think my brother-in-law is going to as well. He was actually, he told me he'd done a bunch of research, and he was, oh yeah, there's this marathon and that one, and this one starts up in the mountains, and I think I can get us a condo, and we can go there the night before instead of having to drive up at 3 a.m. to get there. So yeah, I think the plan this time is to pay the money for the race ahead of time so we can't back out of it because uh, if you don't pay the money it's easy to say no nah, you know what I'm not gonna make it I quit but once you've paid a hundred dollars to run in a race then you're like 
no, nah, I better do it. That was a lot of money, so I better do it. So yeah, that's kind of our plan this year, is to pay the money up front and early on and lock ourselves in. And hopefully none of us get injured or something, because then we'll be out of luck. But uh, yeah, we're hoping uh, that that will motivate us to not quit. How about you? What are your goals for 2014? Have you any? I haven't made any, no. One of my goals for 2013 was to start selling my work. Uh huh. And I did actually start on that. And I, I, there, before things got busy, I would try and put up a story for free and a story for pay every week. Were they similar length or were the stories for free like much shorter? Yeah, the stories for free were really short always. Like drabbles or near um, um, to? I never put up any drabbles. But like I, a 500 word thing or something? Yeah, I guess so. And, you know, I was doing my own podcast in 2013 and it's not a goal but I would like to put more of those out there one of the things they said at the new media expo which is in our future as far as the listeners are concerned was you know that you're supposed to brand yourself and not your work and I mean we could go on and on about whole, the whole branding and monetizing and let me try and make something for money rather than for passion and how much I don't like that but one of the things they seem to pound into the head a lot was, you know, there are people that want to buy your stuff, but they have to know about it. And uh, as far as this show goes and on, on the Dune Steve, I very rarely mention, you know, hey, I recorded a story and you can buy it on Audible. And I, that should be a goal for 2014 is to do that way, way more. For example, I did a Ray Bradbury story called The Concrete Mixer that's available to purchase on Audible right now, and I... 1995. I, oh, I'm sure it's much, <laughs> much less than that, because it was just a short story. I was trying to make it into more of a commercial. If you get, if you buy it now, you get this as well. You get two copies of the Ray Bradbury story. That's right. Ginsu Plus a sham wow. You know, I was really, really excited to be able to read a Ray Bradbury story, because he is really the... the father of science fiction, at least in the 20th century, you know, the, I don't know what his title would have been, but he was the premier science fiction writer of the 20th century. They at least call him a grand master, I think. Yeah. But, but there's a lot of those. We try not to endorse the clan on our show. He's a grand master. More than we have to. But, it, you know, I should at least just start right now and try and do that stuff because the whole point of me joining up with ACX and Audible and doing audiobooks was that you know this is something that I enjoy doing that I think I do fairly well but wouldn't it be neat to be able to to do it for a living or at least to make a, a little bit of money off doing it and part of the onus of selling all this stuff lies in, in the hands of the rights holders of the authors or the publishers or whoever that is well we're right there um but the other half should be on my shoulders. You know, it's like I worked on this, in some cases a hell of a lot longer than the people who actually wrote it, which I, it sounds petty, but it's true. Why, why would I not want to advertise it or get the word out there that, hey, I did this? And so I will try and do that more in 2014, even though it goes against my, my Anti nature. Your, your communist nature? I guess it is, yeah. <laughs> Your anti-capitalist anti nature. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, if, if somebody wants to go out there and buy my reading, or my performance of The Concrete Mixer, it's a short story that was published in a pulp magazine in 1949 by Ray Bradbury. And then later it was, like, repurposed and rewritten and published in The Illustrated Man, which was one of his short story collections. But I discovered that this 1949 version is, is different from the uh, Illustrated Man version. And, and so that should make it, you know, at least a curiosity, I would hope. I don't know. There, there was a panel at New Media Expo about... Which is in the future. It, there will be a panel at New Media Expo about, you know, doing your own audiobooks and there being all these people looking for people to narrate audiobooks and how you can turn that into a career. For fun and profit. Yeah. And so uh, maybe I will try to do that more because there are some projects that you and I do 
or we appear on somebody else's show or whatever, where it would be great to talk about it. Like you and I did an Edgar Allan Poe, a novella, I think I'd, it'd be fair to say, by Edgar Allan Poe that we uh, recorded for Marshall Latham's Journey Into podcast. And I'm sure Marshall can use the traffic directed in his direction <laughs> on that. But also it'd be fun just to talk about that, you know, when that comes out the challenges of that darn story and we don't seem to do that nearly as much as we used to because it's not so special when somebody asks us no i don't mean not so special it's not so unique when somebody asks us to be on their show like it used to be right so what you're saying then is one of your goals is to shill your work a little more often on the areas that you have to shill it i don't like that word okay but pimp from- Pimp your work. You like that one? Hey, I know what you like. You love that word. Uh, promote more. Oh, okay. Because, you know, I tend to do a blog post every time an audiobook comes out that I've recorded, but we never talk about it on the show, and there's got to be way more people that listen to the Steve <laughs> than go to my blog. I think by perhaps a thousand times. <laughs> <laughs> and okay, that seems like a good idea. I'll promote all the stuff that I do, too, way more. Okay. Um. Uh, Now, one thing (laughs) that we will experience at the New Media Expo in the short future is, near future, is Abby Hilton saying, you know, you really need to make your writing goals big because it's too depressing to hear about you failing again. (laughs) Yes, I think Abby Hilton might say that to me when we go there. (sighs) Although she... I think she may just be more on on the camp of you should stop making these writing goals that you know you won't achieve and you should stop being so hard on yourself and understand you don't have enough time to do things and let yourself relax a little bit and enjoy your life that you do have while it's here and then when you have more time dive back into the writing things is what she's been telling me because she's just like what? You have a two-year-old at home, you've got to stop beating yourself up and just relax a little bit and let yourself be maybe a consumer for a while. Read books and, and, you know, stop worrying so much about your failures as a writer. Maybe she has something there. I don't know. I don't know if I could do that, though. You know what I mean? If I could let the guilt go when I don't write. Do you think you could do that? Just not feel guilty when you don't write? Just say, okay, no, I'm not writing right now. I'm taking a year off. I don't know. I know myself fairly well, and I think about writing every day, even if I don't do the writing. Uh-huh. I mean, it's not, it's a part of me. It's how my mind works. I love coming up with stories and thinking about stories and characters and what might happen to them. And a lot of time, I don't write it down, and what a shame. You know, it's lost forever. But, yeah, I mean, if... if what's her name Kate Upton said you know I'll go out with you but you have to promise not to write for a year I guess I could do it and enjoy being a consumer and a half (laughs) but it's difficult and and yes neither of us reach our goals with writing ever we may have little successes here and there but like the major overarching success that we would desire doesn't come to us and when I have a conversation with somebody like Abby I'll say, hey, what uh, what are you working on right now? And 20 minutes later, we've finished that conversation. You know what I mean? She's got so much ambition, so much on her plate, so many projects she's doing. And Brian's the same way. I was like, oh, what are you working on, Brian? He started alphabetically. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because that's the uh, only way you can keep track of them all. Which is great. And it's not to say that I'm not like that, because I totally am. I have several projects in various states of completion. And three or four Dune Steve episodes that I said, okay, I'll do that story. Yeah, I have a half-written story in the trunk right now. By you? Yeah, yeah, it's in the trunk, and it's one that I've been writing uh, in, like, waiting rooms and things like that when the time comes. And it is perhaps the dirtiest story I have ever written and perhaps will ever write. I don't know. Wow, well, see, um, now I am curious. I'm bi-curious. I would really like to know <laughs> what... Uh, the love of a good man feels like no that well yes i what i would like to know uh about this dirty story you've written that's really cool you know that's something that we talked about 
not on the air, but we talked about it while we were walking around the strip. Again, we will talk about it when we go to Las Vegas. Was <laughs> one of the genres that sells really, really, really well in audio is erotica. Yeah, unfortunately, this one doesn't qualify as erotica. It's well, it's not... a paranormal romance, or what is it? Uh, it's more along those lines, yes. I guess it would be considered a fantasy story if, like, Walter Mitty, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, counts as a fantasy story. Does somebody going into their imagination count as a fantasy story? I think so, yeah. Okay, so it's a fantasy story. Well, that's cool. I and, mean, like, uh, here, give us a... A New Year's resolution of how of when you're going to write that or of when you're going to complete it or anything. Well, I'm probably going to... It's likely that I won't uh, be going to a waiting room very often in the very near future because I have been... Fat. Fat. And now I'm not. No, wait, I'm still fat. So that has nothing to do with it. But yeah, my wife's job is going to be changing her hours and so... I will no longer likely be selling bodily fluids for money, which I have been doing for the last short while. I am Starbucks. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, I've been doing uh, pla donating plasma, and uh, yeah, I'm not going to probably be able to do that soon, so I was using my time sitting in the waiting room to uh, write. I haven't done it in a, a little while, and I may not do it at all soon. So I'll probably have to write that story in some other place, some other way. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. It might be one of those stories I don't want to just leave sitting around the house, considering that it's kind of dirty. Just in case my kids are like, hey, what's this here? There's writing on this uh, notebook. I've never had any interest in what my father does before, but for some reason I'm going to try this one. All right. Oh, well. They'd be like, oh, no, I can't read this stuff. This is, what is, this is that crazy cursive that I've heard about, but never actually seen done. Because nobody does that anymore. I don't think they even teach it in school anymore. It's gotten to the point where they're like, no, we're not going to bother. People don't write. Especially not this long form stuff. If printing is good enough. Anyways, what should we make? A, 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 a Do we need to make a deadline? See... I think when we get to New Media Expo here soon, um, I think Renee might tell me something about how it's probably better to make writing goals about the process rather than the end result. Yeah, the end result. I, I think she may say something about that to us while we're there. So maybe I need to consider a different way of making goals. But how do you make a goal of the process of writing? Like, say I'm going to write every day? Is that a goal for the process? Or I'm going to write 30 minutes a week or an hour a week? Or does that count as a goal of the process? What are I the think goals so, the because if you say, I'm going to have that story written by February 1st, that's maybe an incentive to slack off until the very end of January and then write a really shoddy uninspired version of the story because you've got to get to the goal, you know what I mean? I, I, I don't know. I didn't hear Renee have this conversation with you, so... Or I, I'm sorry, I won't. You won't be there when she has this conversation? Yeah. See, I assume giving a deadline would be there for a end result kind of a thing, but wouldn't saying I want to write every day for 30 minutes be the same kind of a thing? And if you don't... I mean, that seems like even harder because if you don't write once you've already broken your goal and you've failed and you need to quit. So yeah, that's one of those okay, things. Okay, well maybe a page number a week then. Something realistic of the number of pages I'm going to write a week, which means, okay, if I don't have it done on Friday, then I'm going to have to work extra hard on Saturday mm -hmm. to make this goal. But even that, if you miss one week, you've failed in your goal. Yeah, it's... it's Just I, make the I goal heard... that you will actually finish that story rather than letting it fall by the wayside. That's something, and I know it's not a process goal, it's a finished thing, but just, you See, know. Once I've heard that process kind of goals are maybe just a different way of making a goal rather than saying, I will do this, and then when you don't achieve, well, you're depressed and you quit, is that you 
have to somehow change, you're changing the kind of person that you are, so instead your goal is that I will become the kind of person that writes every day. Instead of I will write every day, I'm going to be the kind of person that tries to write every day or something like that. So that if you miss a day, well, you haven't failed, because even the kind of person who tries to write every day misses a day here and there. So you can keep trying. It's like, I will be the kind of person who doesn't like to eat sweets all the time. You know, that's a goal to help you lose weight or something. You change the kind of person you are and think of yourself as something different. And I know I've heard that change your perception of yourself, try to think of yourself in a different way, it actually makes a huge difference in the way you act. So maybe something like that would be a more process-oriented goal rather than giving myself a deadline or giving myself a number of pages a week or whatever. Okay, yeah, that sounds good. Of course, I can't help but roll my eyes because you ate an entire bag of sugar today with a spoon. <laughs> yeah, it's because my last day to eat bags of sugar is today. It's time to really dive in. I was thinking, you know, okay, New Year's, but with New Media Expo on its way, I kind of have to, when you're traveling, it's impossible to take really good care of yourself. You can take somewhat good care of yourself, but you have to eat out all the time, and it's, yeah, basically impossible. So I was just like, I'm just going to go for it while we're traveling. When I get back, then it's time to knuckle down. So maybe I will be the kind of person that doesn't like to eat sweets for the rest of the year. So maybe we'll try to be that kind of person that doesn't eat sweets. Yeah. Okay, so that's a that's a goal for the the new year is to become the person that writes every day. I wrote so much less in 2013 than I did in 2012 that I, you know, I feel like wow, I took a couple of huge steps back. But I published so much more in 2013 than I did in 2012. And some of that energy that goes into writing got redirected into publishing and a lot of the energy that goes into writing got redirected into doing audiobooks. It's just something that uh, that I thought I would try and so far I you know I think the jury is out as to whether it was successful or not. But you it's not some one of those things that you can do and 3 weeks later say yay I am a successful writer. It's process. Right. To be the kind of person that puts his work out there and says, if you would like to buy this, it is there. Rather than, you know, I am the guy who thinks that his stuff is so good that when he farts, the room smells better. Which, you know, we, we know people that are like that. There are definitely writers that put forth that attitude, whether they believe it or not, and maybe they're the successful writers. I just, it's a process for me to try and be more inclined to share my work, more inclined to say, I am going to charge a couple bucks for this because I worked hard on it. And if you do something well, you never do it for free, which is what the Joker said in the Dark Knight movie. So I don't know that I should be quoting a, a psychopath <laughs> as my you know, life well, coach. It's still a good thing to say. Yeah, I mean, if you, uh, you want to do something, I don't know. I mean, that's the the labor is worthy his hey how does that go the Something laborer that's... is worthy of his oil craft the I can't remember how it goes but it's basically even Jesus said that you should be paid for your labor so uh, yeah I think you should well, what if you go to a Scott Sk Sigler panel when we go to this new media expo and he says something like every minute you're spending time working on publishing stuff you're not writing and that you need to manage that yeah. or get somebody who can do it for you <laughs> that was the true lesson that his speech put forth or will put forth when we go to new media expo is what you need is somebody to do all that stuff for you and he had an assistant or a partner, I guess he would call her, who works on his scheduling, 
who encourages him to, you know, do the stuff that's productive. It's like, you know, you're not writing right now, who uh, maybe books his hotels, who, you know, reminds him of the things that's, that are on his to-do list and all that stuff. And yeah, if you and I had somebody like that, we would have twice as many Dune Steve episodes out. We really would. And any movie that either of us sees, there would be a That Gets My Goat About. And all that just because there's so much that goes into it. You know, I, I finish an episode and I put it in the Dropbox for you to get, but it's hard for me to remember that you have to make, you have to upload it to archive.org or Libsyn or whatever it is and make all sorts of links to it and create cover art for it and embed that into the signal somehow of the mp3 and make different versions one that's for the the feed one that's for direct download one that's for playing on the site itself and for, i don't know how many hours that process takes but it's none of it is creative right. none of it is actually making the show it's sometimes making the art feels creative that's true. That's true. Other times it's just, ah, oh, I just need a picture. One picture that just portrays that. And I don't really do any creativeness. I just find a picture that matches. And that's something that Sigler talked about is, you know, you, you make your own cover art. Well, he, what he was saying is find somebody that does that well Which, and pay them to do it. When it comes down to it, we know a lot of people that do it well and that have volunteered to do it for us. And if only we were organized enough... We would have artwork for every story that was done by an artist, you know, if only we were organized enough to get this stuff done ahead of time. Yeah. Instead, what always happens is, okay, episode's done, oh crap, what should we do for art? Oh, um, I don't know, what about a picture of dentist tools? Okay, yeah, that, that should probably work. And yeah, that's how our art winds up getting done usually, and it'd be so much better if we could just get organized enough to say, hey, you have volunteered for us your stuff is good can you do a picture for this story and you you can do a picture for this story and you and then we'll have them ready when they you know maybe I, that can be a goal of ours it should be that was one of his things during his speech that he encouraged is you know delegate find people that do things and have them do it don't try and do it all yourself because again every hour you spend working on something that's not your primary goal is an hour you're not writing fiction, or is that what he would say? Writing yeah, fiction. Yeah, he would just say you're the one that's creating content for, you know, the, what you're selling. You are writing the stories that you put on your feed. Uh, if you are like Scott Sigler, who just does his thing. I mean, we, as the Dune Steve, it's not just us. We have other people's stories on as well. But putting those things together, or working on them, editing them, recording them. And that kind of stuff is also things that we aren't doing if we're doing the other stuff, doing the organizing stuff. And that's really, I think, the big problem that we've had in the last year is that I have, I no longer have the time that I used to have to be able to keep track of all that stuff. When we were really humming along and, you know, in the early days when we would do two, three or four episodes a month, that was when I was really on point and really making sure that I kept the organizational stuff going and now yeah I just I don't have that time that I used to have anymore it's been removed from me and and that's why we're getting you know one episode a month or less recently so you know if you would like to volunteer to be our business manager Send us an email if you really love to organize things and make sure that... Uh... Essentially what that would entail is we've got people that have volunteered to produce a story. And once somebody says, hey, I will do that, we really need somebody to say, okay, here's the story. What do you need from us? Can you please have it done by so-and-so day? And as so-and-so day gets closer, that person lets them know, hey, so-and-so day is almost here. How is that coming? I don't know. For some reason, that is so hard for me to do. Just the whole accountability thing and calling somebody up and, or emailing them and saying, hey, you know, it's really close to April. How Are you going to get that done for us? 
Yeah, it is difficult uh, to keep track of. It should be easier. I should, you know, like I've got like a phone and a computer and all that kind of stuff. that have calendars and reminders and all that. I should be able to just enter that stuff in, but I'm just not that organized. You know, the phone could probably even just remind me. I could have Siri be an executive assistant or something. But, uh, yeah, I'm just not organized like that to be able to take care of it, which I think is probably pretty common for creative folks to be disorganized. The funny thing is a person like that would also even need to chide us and get us to do things that we're falling down on. Because I know, like just the other day, we've had somebody assigned to produce one of our triple word score stories. And she said, okay, you do this and you do that to us. And <laughs> I, yeah, I, just, I, I just got an email from her and she said, hey, uh, how's that coming? When should I expect the part that you're supposed to do to be here? And I have no memory of her telling me that I needed to do anything at all. So it's good that she reminded me. Of course, you know, we had Scott Sigler's executive assistant to remind us, then uh, we would not have forgotten that. She yeah. was really on the ball, too. I mean, that was amazing to me because I asked Scott, hey, this story that we're reading, <laughs> is it different from the one on a skate pod? And he said, uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, and she knew yeah, the he, answer. He's like, no, I think it's the same one. I don't think it's changed in five or six years. And she's like, no, it was rewritten. <laughs> he's just like, oh. The end of his speech, he was done. And he's like, all right, I guess I'm done. Any more questions? No? Okay. And then, of course... She basically reminded him that he needed to tell a joke at the end. <laughs> Asked him how warm it was inside of a tauntaun. How warm is it inside of a tauntaun, Big? It's lukewarm. Love that joke. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> oh, um, car accident in the making. Accident oh. right in front of us is going to happen. Oh, no, okay. Death averted. Well, we're about going half the speed limit, though. <laughs> Anyway, but yes, at least we're all still alive. There are so many things we could talk about in this episode, but we probably shouldn't, uh, except for that uh, I have a certain level of talent when it comes to making cover art for my stories that's very, very low. And if I want my cover art to look better, I send it to you. Like, you know, like my cover art for Office Visit that you can buy on Amazon.com or you can buy on Smashwords is so inferior to the cover art for the episode of Office Visit that hit on the Dune Steve, which you made. And if we had sent it to, say, Gino Moretto, which I have has asked him to do cover art for a couple of my stories, those are the ones that, like, look super professional and stuff. But I just, I don't want to depend on you, and I don't, certainly don't want to depend on Gino to do cover art for all of my stories. Well, there are a lot of people. I mean, there's the when it's not your strength, it shouldn't be something you're, like, I mean, I think that's what Scott will tell us in his panel, is that the thing that you're strong at, what you're doing is writing the stories. And doing the artwork is not your strength because it's a completely different thing. I mean, people go to school for four years or longer in college to learn how to do art. Um, and you go to four years of college and take none of the same classes to learn how to do story writing. And so you shouldn't be expected to know how to do art. You should get in contact with the people that do know how to do it and get them to do it for you. And yeah, obviously you'll have to be prepared ahead of time so that you can say, hey, I am going to publish Office Visit on Amazon in three weeks. Can you give me a have me a, a thing ready for it by then. Okay, well, hey, anybody who's listening to this, <laughs> if you want to go to smashwords.com and type in Rish Outfield, I have at least a dozen stories there. And if you think that you can do a better cover art for one of those stories, send me an email, either at rishout at aol.com or at editor at Steef, and I'd be happy to have one of your covers replace the one that's on there on Smashwords, and that's something that, I mean, if you like to draw, I would really appreciate that. Cool. Um, so we're going to 
finish this episode up now? Yes, then? yes. Let's, let's say this was our New Year's episode and we can talk later about other stuff. Okay, we'll talk later about other stuff. We'll see you um, on, an, on the next On The Go episode, folks. Thanks for listening. I'm Big Ankovic. And I'm Rich Outfield. And have a happy New Year. That Gets My Goat is produced under Creative Commons 3.0, attribution, no derivatives, share-alike license. That means you can't sell it, but you can share it with everybody. It also means you have too much time on your hands. Uh, yeah, I never understand this song. It's like, should should we remember these people, or should we remember the people that we've forgotten? But if we've forgotten them, how do we remember that we should remember them?